Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's seminar. I'm glad to welcome uh, Dr. Pedro Moreno Sanchez, uh, who is working as assistant research professor at the uh, INDEA Software Institute in Spain. Pedro received his PhD in computer science from uh, Purdue University in 2018. And uh, before joining uh, INDEA, he was a postdoc researcher at the TU Vienna. His main research interests are blockchains, uh, privacy enhancing technologies, and applied crypto. And today he will present security, privacy, and scalability in blockchain technologies. Uh, just uh, before starting with uh, his talk, I just want to remember everyone that uh, you can make your questions to the speaker using the Q&A chat, and uh, he will try to address as many as the time allow us at the, at the end of the day. So uh, that's it. Uh, Pedro, the stage is yours. Perfect. Well, thanks, Santos, for the nice interaction. And thank you, everybody, for inviting me to, to give this talk. Santos mentioned I'm, I'm Pedro. I'm working as an assistant professor in there. And today I'm here to talk to you about some of the work I have done for security, privacy, and scalability for blockchains. Before going into details, I guess the first question that we should ask ourselves is that why we need a blockchain to, to start with. And a bit of historical background is that this comes from the time where we were using the banking system, where we, where we had banks, this central entity that was keeping tracks of the users and the balances associated with each of the users. Uh, Alice has a certain amount, like 1,500 something coins, uh, Bob has that amount, and, and so on. And this actually uh, has been working. You, can you, can you my... Sorry? No, you can you can go on. Okay, sorry. Um, so yeah, so this banking system actually has been working and it's actually being worked uh, today as well. But the bank itself is a trusted third party and we have to trust it for security, meaning that it has to validate every of the single transactions. And we also trust it for keeping the correct balance of the users. And it's also a trusted third party for privacy, in the sense that we trust the bank not to leak the amount or the balances that each of us have in the bank today. However, with the financial crisis of uh, around 2008 or 2009, people were actually questioning this model and were questioning whether it's the best model that we could have. And they were proposing an alternative system, alternative economic models that we could use instead of the instead of the bank system. And this one of those models were a blockchain itself. If we look at the core of it, uh, we, what is a blockchain? What is the core of, of such a technology? Well, so blockchain is keeping an immutable append only data structure that we call the ledger. This data structure that keeps, tri uh, keeps track of every single transaction. And this, le this ledger is maintained by a set of participants that we call the miners. And they do that by means of a distributed protocol that they run to reach consensus about which transactions are valid or not. If we look at the figure below, we have a certain users that want to interact with the blockchain. And they do that by submitting transactions to the miners. Now, these miners run this distributed protocol, and they decide whether this new transaction is valid or not. When they reach consensus that the new transaction is valid, they will add it to the ledger. They will add it to what would be also called the blockchain. Blockchain started as a really as a social experiment around 2009 with the with the blockchain or the first one being Bitcoin, and this social experiment has exploded or has been followed by thousands of blockchain technologies. After that, we have today Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, Monero, Zcash, and probably many others that I didn't put in this in this slide. And not, it's not longer a social experiment, but it's also has been established in the industry because they have found it useful for several use cases or several scenarios. For example, their industry or the industry of the supply chain has found useful blockchain to save around 40 billion per year. Banking system around the world also has saved a lot of money by using blockchains. For example, we have the case of Santander in Spain, but also all around the world, we have examples in the UK, Japan, and many other cases that I, uh, and many other cases I don't have the, 
the slide space to put, but there are many other, many other use cases. However, if we look at all these different applications of blockchain, they all share the same core principle. It is what I mentioned before, they want to maintain a shared, a public ledger that has all the transactions that happened in the past. And this, let me remind you that it's good for security in the sense that we no longer have to trust to a central party, a single trusted third party like the bank, or rather we rely on a decentralized system, a decentralized protocol run by the miners. So what we have now is we achieve a system where we can publicly verify every single transaction. In particular, we can verify the validity of every transaction and which is the balance of, of each of the users in the system. However, if you look at the principle itself, this is not so good from the privacy point of view. In particular, having a public ledger that contains every single transaction that happened in the system gives out way too much sensitive information about the users. And this is one of the aspects that I'm interested in my research. Let me tell you exactly more what I mean with this problem of privacy in blockchains. I firmly believe that privacy is a crucial feature that we should have in blockchains. For example, if we as users use the blockchain, we want to maintain our transactions hidden. For example, I don't want to, I want to reveal what are my medical bills or what is my salary. Companies using the blockchain also need privacy. So they want to maintain their business hidden from the prying eyes of the competitors. And the, even the, the, the functionality of the blockchain itself requires privacy, in particular in the, we, they need what we call fungibility, that every coin looks the same. And this must be achieved to preserve utility. The same way that for us, when we use the cash, every single note is, has the same value as any other note in the system. For us in blockchain, every single digital coin should look and has the same value as any other digital coin in the, in the blockchain. However, to achieve these features, we have a, a strong challenge, a strong dichotomy. On one side, in order to achieve privacy, what intuitively we want to have is to maintain transactions and balances hidden, so nobody can look at them. But from the security point of view, what we want is public verifiability. So we want the transactions can be publicly verified. So the challenge is how we can achieve these two, these two uh, properties at the same time with, when they seem contradictory at the same time. So how we do that, um, we do that over several uh, years of research. And what the current state is that in the privacy in the current blockchains is in many cases understudied. So we don't know exactly what is the exact notion of privacy that we achieve. We also lack formal definitions of privacy, or what is the privacy notion of interest in certain blockchain systems. And what we require also is a payment protocols that achieves this and can achieve these privacy guarantees and we can formally prove that they achieve these privacy functions. So let me go a bit more in detail of what the work I have done regarding privacy or achieving privacy in the blockchain systems. For that, uh, I'm pretty sure that most of you might have heard of what Bitcoin does and how it works, but just make sure that we're on the same page. Let me tell you the basics of how this uh, blockchain works. So every user in this can interact with the Bitcoin blockchain by creating a pair of, of digital signature, a pair of keys in a digital signature scheme. So you can create as many as you want, and every pair has a signing key, which is private, and a verification key, which is public. And now any others, and we can have, of course, more than one user, and every user does the same. If a user wants to interact, creates its own pair of keys, and with that, they can interact with the Bitcoin blockchain. How they interact? Well, imagine that the, every coin, every digital coin in Bitcoin is defined by a tuple, which is the number of the amount, the, in this case, 5.4357, and the verification key that represents the owner of the coins. In this case, uh, BK1 belongs to Alice, so meaning that Alice is the owner of these five points or something Bitcoins. Now, if Alice wants to transfer one Bitcoin to Bob, what Alice will create is a Bitcoin transaction where the input is uh, the, the tuple I have set so far, and then we create two outputs. One output where she sends one Bitcoin to Bob, meaning that one Bitcoin to the verification key that belongs to Bob, and the rest, she sends it to another output that has the verification key of herself, in this case, BK2. 
And this is because in Bitcoin, in every trans and every transaction must transfer all the coins that are in a single input. In this case, the transaction must transfer all the coins that are in BK1. When such a transaction is created by Alice, this transaction has to be authorized. And this is done by Alice signing the transaction with the signing key of the input. In this case, in this case Alice has to sign with the signing key one. And this transaction becomes valid meaning that she can send it to the, to the miners. The miners will run consensus, validate that it is actually correct, and eventually add it to the blockchain itself. Okay, so given that, what is, the, what is the privacy problem? So what is the information that we can derive? Well, the conjecture in, in the community was that we, this system was privacy preserving because every user could use uh, different verification keys every time. So they could use uh, generate fresh keys for every single interaction. And with that, we could no longer link keys to the users and privacy was preserved. This is a concept called pseudonymity. However, there are several words that have shown that this is not the case. There are several heuristics that allow to link different public keys to a certain user. For example, in the simple case that I have shown so far, imagine that I'm an observer or we have an attacker that's an observer, sees from the blockchain, from the ledger, the transaction that we have just described. The server can observe that most likely the input and the output with 4.4357 belong to the same user because the, is the change address or the remaining amount that remain after the sender paid to the receiver. Moreover, most likely because the output has a concrete amount, like an amount without decimals, then uh, the BK3 is the verification key belonging to the receiver. Yet the adversary has been able to link two verification keys together, yet the adversary doesn't know which is the actual user, for example, the IP address behind the user. However, if the adversary also managed to run one of the miners, then the adversary will see which is the, the user that is sending the transaction to the mining process. Therefore, the miner will also see the source of the transaction. Therefore, can link the fact that BK1 and BK2 belong to Alice to, to start with. And therefore, BK3 should belong to the other person. And in particular, when Bob later in, the, in time will spend the coins in BK3, then the miner will also learn that BK3 belongs to, to Bob itself. So at the end, in this attack, the adversary will learn which public keys belong to Alice and who is the real user behind the public keys themselves. One other or another aspect that I have been studying in my, in my research is uh, what is the privacy leakage that appears when we interact across different blockchains together. So imagine that Alice has some coins in Bitcoin and she wants to transfer those coins into another system, another blockchain system, in this case, Ripple. Ripple, uh, haven't told you the details, but Ripple basically is a system that uh, mimics the, the current bank system in the digital world. So while Bitcoin is a debt-based system, Ripple is a credit-based system. So meaning that, for example, Alice will pay her Bitcoins to exchange, let's say Bitstamp, the Bitstamp will issue the corresponding amount in debt to, to Alice. So this interaction across two different blockchains will result in the corresponding transactions in the corresponding layers. For example, we have a transaction in Bitcoin where Alice has transferred, let's say, 1.0057 to Bitstamp. And in Ripple, we'll see another transaction where a certain public key BK4, in this case, has issued exactly the same amount of Bitcoin in debt in IOUs to another public key, BK5. Now, if we are an observer and we can see these two transactions in the two lectures, using the heuristic I have, decided, I have presented in the slide before, we can link that BK1 and BK2 belong to, to Alice, and BK3 belongs to, to Bitstamp, but also we can now look now looking at the report transaction. We can know that the sender says a transaction was with Sam and the receiver was Alice. Alice. So, but the take home message from this is that the interaction across different blockchains reveal even more information about who are the users and how much money they spent that is revealed by the single blockchains themselves. 
Another privacy issue that we, we observed and we defined, um, it comes from the way that people are using uh, these uh, credit-based systems. And I don't, ha I don't have the time to give you all the details, but the attack comes from a user pattern that we use every day in our lives. So I'm sure that most of you will not have an amount of 100,000 euros or the corresponding one in your wallet. Instead, you will have a way smaller amount and with that, what you do is like you go and you spend it in several things. So you go to a restaurant or you go to the cinema. And when your wallet doesn't have enough money anymore, you go to your bank and withdraw more money. This, has, this behavior that is common in real life has been mimicked also by the users in the, in the Ripple network. Meaning that imagine that we see a transaction pattern like the one we have here in the slide. So we see that there is a common uh, verification key, in this case, VK2, that is being used to pay for different things. Let's say it's paying to VK3 for a certain amount, then VK4, then VK5. And eventually it goes and withdraw money from a different VK1. So following the, the same pattern as in real life, we could derive the fact that VK2 and VK1 is the same. So VK2 would be the wallet of, of the user. VK1 would be the account in the bank for the user itself. So the bottom line of this first part of the talk is that in cryptocurrencies or in blockchains that are based on coins transfers, there are several privacy challenges. But those privacy challenges also appear in other blockchains like credit network, like Ripple and Stellar. And in particular, the interaction between, between them also reveal way more sensitive information about the users and their balances in the, in the system. I have shown you only a peek of a couple of works I have been doing, but there are some others, and I encourage you to go there to, to read the paper if you are interested, and I will be happy to elaborate on them later if you are, if you are interested. There are also studies on the privacy coins, like Monero and Zcash. Uh, I, can, I can elaborate on that later if you, if you are interested. And yeah, bottom, the take home message from this part is that yeah, we have rather a lack of privacy in current cryptocurrencies, and this is a big stoppage for adoption in practice. Now we switch gears to a um, second problem that is also really interesting for me, which is the scalability problem that we have in, in blockchains. What, are, what do I mean by scalability? Well, as I mentioned, we have this ledger, this decentralized data structure that records every single transaction that happened in the system. And again, this is really a good thing in the sense that we have now for the first time publicly or public verifiability for every single transaction. However, if we compare this system with a more centralized system like Visa or MasterCard, the fact that everyone has to check the whole blockchain makes the transaction rate way smaller. So the amount of transaction that we can do in Bitcoin is around 10 or seven or 10 transactions per second, which, which is way below what we can achieve with Visa. So in this picture, it's a test that they, it's a stress test that they reported, it's around 24,000 transactions per second. But the more recent one, they showed that it can go even like two times that, which is way larger. So the question is how, what we can do in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum to achieve the transaction rates that we have in more centralized systems like Visa Master. Of course, I'm not the first one that have, so, that have thought about this problem and not the first one that is proposing solutions to that. So if we could actually look at all the solutions, we could roughly group them into, into main trends. So one, one trend is what is called the on-chain solutions or layer one solutions. And what they do basically is that they take the definition of the distributed protocol used for consensus and they tweak, they tweak it or they come up even with new distributed protocols for, to reach consensus. The, the good part of the pro for this uh, approach is that it directly increases transaction rate. If you're, if you can define a new distributed protocol that for the consensus that gives you a higher transaction rate, then your bl blockchain will have more transaction per second directly. However, on the negative side, these solutions are not backwards, compa backwards compatible with the current blockchains, meaning that if you change the consensus of the system, you are basically creating a new blockchain, means that you have to deploy it and see and strive for adoption from the, from the community. 
The second approach, which is an alternative to, to the first one, is what we call off-chain or layer two. The idea is that, okay, we have this layer one, this consensus algorithm in the blockchain that is actually heavy and we can use it only for a few transactions, but let's use it as few as possible. Okay, so let's make uh, most of the transaction of the chain between the users in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. Let's use the layer one only when it's necessary. And I will elaborate later what I mean with that. This approach actually has uh, been taken more in, into practice, and there are really uh, there are practical deployments uh, that are being used today. For example, the Lightning Network for payment chain networks, Rider Network, which is the similar approach in payment chain networks for Ethereum, and there are many other projects that are actually being developed uh, and they are being researched and developed in practice, like Bolt, Peru, Liquidity Network, and many many others. As I mentioned, I'm interested in this second approach of off-chain or, or layer two. But to give you a more concrete idea of what I meant by, by this uh, uh, layer two approach, uh, let me tell you a, a bit of the concept of payment channel, what this uh, payment channel idea is. And here we have at the bottom what would be the ledger, what, is, uh, what are the transactions that are added to the blockchain through the consensus algorithm. And in the top of the line, we'll have what is executed off-chain, meaning a two-party protocol between Alice and Bob that is not actually put in the blockchain. So imagine now Alice has some, some Bitcoins and Alice wants to um, buy some goods from Bob, let's say some, some book. So what she can do is that she can create, she can open a channel. So she can create a transaction signed by her where she puts five coins in this case, she puts some coins of her into what is called a multi-signature uh, an output that is controlled by both by Alice and Bob. When the coins are in that output, these coins can be only spent when they both agree. And this agreement is implemented with signatures. So these coins can be only spent in a follow-up transaction that is signed by both Alice and Bob. When Alice has that, then she puts this transaction on the blockchain and the channel is effectively open. Now the, the trick or why the why we go payment channels off chain is because every single payment from now on will happen between Alice and Bob without the interaction of the blockchain itself. So imagine that Alice now wants to pay one Bitcoin for to Bob. What she does is that she creates a transaction that redistributes the money in the in the multi seek in the in the channel itself. Says, okay, from the five coins that I initially put, Bob, I will put four back to me and I will give you one out of it. And this is signed by, by Ali to itself and then sent, sent to Bob. Here, notice that for Bob, this is a valid payment because the only thing that Bob needs to do is to sign this transaction with his own signing key. But this he can always do because he has the signing key himself. However, instead of putting this transaction in the blockchain, he just stores it locally and wait for further payments coming from Alice. Particularly imagine that Alice a bit later wants to buy a second book. So she wants to pay one extra Bitcoin. So what she will do is create a second transaction that redistributes again the money from the channel. So she said, okay, now Bob, look, from the five coins that I had in the channel, I will send three back to me and two to you now. And she signs the transaction. And now Bob will have two states, two transactions that are valid at the same time. But of course, for Bob, it's always better to only publish this one, the one that he gets two coins instead of, instead of one. So he deletes the previous one and stores this one locally. Of course, we can do this process again and again. And at some moment, when they need the coins back, they will do what is the close operation. So Bob will sign the last state and put it on the, on the blockchain. So the bottom line of this approach is that Alice and Bob can perform an arbitrary number of payments between them, while the blockchain will see only two transactions, one to open the channel itself, and a second one to close it, to, meaning that uh, they redistribute the coins in the initial channel according to the last payment that Alice has sent to Bob. Okay, so this protocol is actually nice, but has a huge restriction. The restriction is that it allows payments only between two participants. What would be super nice, what would be interesting actually, is that if we could do payments between any two participants in the world. 
Um, one approach will be that we create such a payment channel between every two participants, creating what will be like a click between them. However, this is really expensive. I mean, because uh, as you have seen, creating a channel requires to lock coins in such a channel beforehand. So in a sense, like the amount of coins that Alice will need to have in advance will be proportional to the number of friends or the number of channels that she wants to create in the first place. So what has happened in practice, and this is the implementation of payment channel networks, is that Alice will create only a channels with a, with a bunch of users, and those users will create channels with some others, therefore creating what is a network of payment channels between, between users. And using these, these channels, this network of channels now, every two users connected through a path, they can transfer coins between themselves. So imagine that now, for example, Alice wants to send one coin to Carol, but Alice doesn't have a direct channel with Bob, but a transitive one through, through Bob. So what Alice will do is like, okay, Bob, I want to send one, Carol, one uh, Bitcoin to Carol, so I send it to you, please forward it to Carol. And then Alice will send it to Bob, and Bob will forward it to Carol itself. So this is the basic mechanism of the multi, what we call multi-hop payment in a payment channel network. As you might have thought, of course, this, uh, this simple mechanism leads to many problems, to many challenges, and this is why I'm really interested in payment time networks. So the first one is how we make this payment secure, like how we enforce that owner users does, do not lose coins. The example before, how we make sure that once Ali sends the coins to Bob, Bob just simply doesn't run away with them instead of forwarding it to Carl. A second big challenge is privacy again. Like, okay, now Bob really sees payments that go through him and he can correlate uh, who is paying to whom. So how we can hide that in the first place. And there are many other challenges. We also have the problem of concurrent payments. So, so you have seen the capacity of the channel is limited by the number of coins that are allocated in the, at the time of opening the channel itself. So how we can allow concurrent payments in such a, a bandwidth restricted network or coin restricted network, if you want to say it like that. Another problem is the routing itself. Okay, so we, we have channels, but we need to find routes between the sender and the receiver to, to start with in order to do such a multi-hop payment. And many of the challenges that they didn't have uh, the slide, this space in the slide to boot, but we can we can discuss later. The following, I'm gonna give you uh, my research in some of those challenges, in particular security and privacy. Let me start with security. As I mentioned, the, the problem of security in, in PCNs is that Alice could pay to Bob and Bob should Bob could just simply not forward the coin to Carl. So what we need is a mechanism that allows to make this process, the two-step process atomically, meaning that Alice will pay to Bob if and only if Bob pays to Carl. This has been actually uh, um, solved in the current implementation of payment channel networks in the Lightning network with a smart contract compatible in Bitcoin, which is called has time block contract. Meaning that Alice pays to Bob not based on a certain condition. In particular, Alice will pay one coin to Bob if Bob is able to show the pre-image of a certain hash value. So Alice will give a value Y and Bob will get the coins only if he's able to show a value X such that, such that H of X is equal Y. And of course, because Bob may never do that, um, we need to add also a certain timeout such that Alice can recover, can refund the money if Bob does never, never solves the pass. With that, with that uh, piece of smart contract in place, we can do a multi-hop payment as I will show later. So, Basically, this is how I'm gonna represent this in the, in the rest of the talk. I'm gonna have a transaction where in the right, I'm gonna put the conditions. In this case, will be um, the lock or the pre-image of the Y value is needed or the timeout itself. Okay, so the conjecture, one they have this building block, the conjecture in the Lightning Network and the current space, uh, payment side network was that we can chain together several of these HCLCs to enable what we call an atomic payment, like all or nothing multi-hop payment in the presence of untrusted intermediary. All or nothing means that either the payment is actually successful in each of the hops in the path or in none of them. 
how it works in practice is depicted. I depicted here in this in this uh, figure. So what happens first is that the receiver creates the the challenge, so it creates both the value x and the hash of x equal y, and sends the value y, the, the, the hash value to to Alice. Now Alice will promise Bob, look Bob, I will pay to you a certain amount, let's say 1.1 coins, if you solve the challenge y before time two. Bob at this point doesn't know how to solve the challenge, but then he can forward the same one to Caro and say, okay, Caro, I have been asked by Alice, so I will pay you one coin now if you tell me the solution for the challenge y. Because Caro was the one creating it in the first place, of course he knows what is the solution, it's, it's x. So Caro will reveal the, the value x to Bob and will receive the coin. And Bob now can take this solution and forward it back to Alice and effectively get in the coins. Here there are a couple of requirements that, are, that we should actually take into account. So first is that for Bob, in order for Bob to be, to be part of a multi-hop payment, it's required that he receives more money than he has to forward. In this case, he received 1.1 coins and he forwards only one, meaning that he gets a 0.1 coins as a service fee. This is what incentivizes intermediaries to forward payments in the payment channel network to start with. However, we studied this, this protocol more in detail and we found a security issue, which is what we call the Warhol attack. Let me tell you graphically what is this, this attack. So imagine that we have a bit longer path between Alice and Caro that goes through two adversaries, E1 and E2, and also Bob. And imagine that they have done already this first phase of committing payments from left to right using the STLC, meaning that Caro has created the the Y and the X, gave already Y to Alice, and they went from left to right doing the fast and block contract step by step. At this point, because Caro knows the solution, Caro could give the value X to E2 in order to, for, uh, to pull the money. But E2 could just simply not reveal it to Bob, but instead wait until this payment expires and give the value X directly to E1. So these are two adversaries that could collude or could even be the same, the same person that has two accounts in the, in the network. Now E1, because could use this solution X, reveal it to Alice and get, and get the money. In that, manner, in that manner, they have effectively bypassed Bob from the successful, the successful finalization of the payment. So basically, we, this is a way where two adversaries in the path can break the all or nothing property meaning that there are some channels in the path that has been successfully paid where other channels have not been able to pay it and the timeout has expired. And this has actually some consequences in practice. First, that B considers the payment has been failed and allows his funds after the timeout. And there is no way for B to know that this is only for him and it, doesn't, it has not happened in the rest of the path. However, from the point of view of the adversary, if you look at it, the adversary will have got 1.3 coins uh, from Alice and forward only one coin to Caro itself. That means that the attacker has earned 0.3 coins, which are the fees that the attacker should have got for forwarding twice the payment, but also the fee from Bob itself, meaning that the, this attack effectively allows attacker to steal the fees from the honest, uh, the honest users that faithfully forward the payment in the first place. So as I mentioned, this all or nothing property that was conjectured in the original payment channel network does no longer hold. And the other problem also is not only that Bob is losing the fee, but also that the, the funds using the channels to forward this payment get locked for the whole duration of the timeout, meaning that they are not using for this payment, but cannot be used for any other payment that happens at the same time and that could be successful. So Bob is losing the fee for this and every other payment that happened in the same duration where the channels are actually locked. And as I mentioned before, the, the, this attack doesn't leave any trace for Bob to blame the adversary uh, of having actually uh, carried out this, this attack. 
Okay, so that was from the security point of view. Um, if we look at the privacy of such a such a system, the situation is not more promising. However, at the, uh, the beginning, when they defined the network, they were they were hopeful that the privacy will hold. And the conjecture was, was, okay, so all these payments are happening off chain. So there is no information that is actually leaked to the ledger itself. So if, if everything is working in a peer-to-peer -peer manner, isn't, isn't it the case that we are having privacy by default? Isn't, isn't it that the payment is, is private just by, by the fact that no information is in the ledger? As you can imagine, if I'm giving this talk, the answer is, is no. So we have some privacy problem. So for that, again, what we did is like we first analyzed the protocol and we formally defined what we mean by privacy in such a network. We define it in the notion of relationship anonymity. And the idea intuitively is that the on path adversaries should not learn who is paying to whom. Yeah? So imagine the, the setting that we have in the figure, we have several senders, in this case, the blue Alice and the green Alice, and we have several receivers, the blue Carol and the green Carol. If the network achieves relationship anonymity, E1 and E2 should not learn which Alice in the left is paying to which Carol in the right. And to make it even, um, make it even a strong adversary, but we, we make some strong assumptions. For example, we say, okay, both payments should use the same intermediary path. So the adversary cannot use the routing information to, to uh, find out who pays to whom. And we also even fix the, the values and the timeouts. So these two pieces of information cannot be used by the attacker to break, to break the privacy notion. Even with such a strong set of assumptions, the current protocol in the payment side networks doesn't, or the payment protocol based on SCLCs doesn't achieve uh, the privacy notion. If you look at it and pay a bit of attention, every the problem is that the same hash value is used along all the pops in the in the path between the sender and the receiver. So imagine that the blue Alice is paying to the uh, blue Carol. What's happening is like E1 sees a payment that is based on a hash value Y, and E2 will forward a payment that is also based on a hash value Y. Therefore, E1 and E2, if they collude, they can easily learn that blue Alice is paying to blue Carol. And the same argument also holds for the green payment between A prime and, and C prime. Therefore, in the paper, we, we not only formalize the notion of anonymity, but we also show that it doesn't hold in the STLC based, based payments in payment chain networks. Okay, no, we, we are not only interested in showing why privacy doesn't hold, but also on giving solutions for that. And our solution, um, it looks a little, a little like this. So basically what we are, what the problem that we identified is that the same condition, the same hash value was used at each of the hops. So what intuitively what we need is a locking mechanism that goes from left to right that uses a different condition at each of the hops. So we need randomized condition at each of the hops that can be only released if you know the key from the right name. And in order to do that, we need some randomness in order to randomize the, the logs, to randomize the condition at each of the logs. These are the two intuitive ideas that we, we have in our protocol. And of course, the one approach, which is the one that we use in, the, in, the, in our protocol, is that the sender is the one that can create such a randomization factors and send it to each of the send it to each of the nodes in the path. However, you can think of it if, the, if we do this naively, the, every user will learn who is the sender. Meaning that if the sender naively sends the randomness to each node in the path, it will have to contact each node and will learn who, who is the sender. What we do is like the sender sends it to each node, but uses a onion packet format similar to how it works in the Tor network. Now, in a bit more detail, what we do is actually is that we create a condition at each of the hops, which is an instance of a D-lock problem. For example, the condition one is that E1 can get the coins if he knows the D-lock of C1, where C1 is defined as G to the K1. So G is a, it's a group generator, K1 is a randomness. So if E1 manages to break the lock of C1 and reveal K1, he will be able to lock the coins. Now, E1 can forward the same 
log to, to be, but based on a randomized condition. So it's a D log instance with not only key one, but key one randomized with K2, like that in every hop from the sender to the receiver. And as before, we need that the receiver knows the solution in advance. So what we do is like the sender gives the whole randomization factor to the receiver itself. And with that, we have enough information to do the login phase from sender to receiver. So Alice will log to E1, E1 will log to B, and B will log to E2, and so on. And E2 will log to C. Now, because Alice knows the solution of the of the D, the solution to the D log problem of C4, she will forward it to E2 itself. Now, if you see the difference between the two conditions, is only the randomization factor K4 that he the E2 knew from before. So he can take the solution given by Carol, take out the randomization factor K4, and this will be the solution for the condition three. This will be the solution to the D log problem of the condition three. And like that, we can do it at every hop from the receiver to the center. So this is the, the basic idea. So instead of using a concrete and the same cryptographic problem at each of the hops, what we needed is a cryptographic problem that can be randomized at each of the hops, and still can be linked between the two neighbors using a certain random, random factor, in this case, the key I, key I. Conditions look random. So this is the basic idea why we get privacy. And security comes from the fact that you, the, your valid key is, you can come up with the valid key only when you get the one from your neighbor and you correctly de de randomize it. Again, the details are in the in the paper. I sorry, I don't have the time to give you all the all the proof. But if you're interested, we can discuss this a bit a bit later as well. One challenge, one practical challenge, if you're interested, that we had also in this project is how do we implement this in in such a manner that this uh, compatible with the different blockchains that we have today, right? So intuitively, what we need to do is to to make a payment from two users selling a channel. Let's say Alice and Bob where Bob can receive the payment, not only with the two signatures in the channel, but also when Bob learns the value K. And the question is, how do we embed this condition of Bob learning the value K inside of the transaction itself? So one approach would be similar to what they did with HTLC. So we could create a tailored smart contract for this condition. We could use something like an ECB smart contract or even for cryptocurrency like Bitcoin to add an opcode that encodes exactly this condition. The receiver should learn the value key. However, this first breaks fungibility. So this is bad from the privacy point of view, meaning that a transaction that has this extra smart contract or this extra opcode is easy, easily to distinguish from a normal transaction with no conditions. So, um, the fungibility no longer holds because two payments can be tell, tell apart. As I mentioned, it's also not backwards compatible. So if we do such a thing, it will be compatible only with cryptocurrencies that have support for this new smart contract or this new opcode. So what we did is like we thought, okay, can we solve this problem cryptographically itself? So many, many trans, so basically every blockchain is authorizing transaction based on a digital signature on the verification of a digital signature. So can we change the signature scheme in such a manner that coming up with a signature is only possible if you know the value K in advance? In other words, how we can embed the condition K or the condition learning K in the signing algorithm itself. And this is what we did and what we call this a scriptless lock contract. So we can lock money in, and in a way that we don't need an extra script. The basic idea, the basic idea is, is, is um, easy to uh, with a sketch in this slide. So basically in every signature scheme or in many of the signature schemes, we have a randomness, the signing key and the message that we want to, that we want to sign. In this case will be the transaction. And the signature when it's correctly computed will give you the, the signature itself with respect to a random point in elliptic curve, let's say R, which is G to the R or in additive form R times J. Now, what we can do, because we are in the two-party setting, we can have a two-party signature scheme, meaning that we can have the randomness and split it in two. We can have, instead of an key, a two-party uh, threshold signature where every, every party has a share of the signature of the signing key. So this will be like a, 
uh, standards uh, two-party threshold signature. Now, when we have that, we can the way that we encode the the, uh, the challenge, you need to learn K in order to create the signature is as follows. So we don't know the value K at this at the moment of signing, but what we know is the public value corresponding to K. So we know the D log instance of K. So we know, in other words, we know G to the K or K to G. So we can add it to the public randomness itself and create a almost valid signature, an almost valid because it computes it's computed based on only RA and RB, but not K. That means that one could verify that the signature is valid up to the point that you need to add the randomness K to the randomness part of the signature itself. So whenever somebody learns a value K, the only thing that needs to do is add this third part of the randomness, and then it will come up with a, with a valid signature. So typically what we do is that we create a randomness and split it in three, Two of them comes from, from the users themselves, and the third element of the randomness is, uh, is the one that is used to encode the, the logic of you need to learn the secret K in order to have a valid signature. So I mentioned, this is the, the basic idea of a script log contract. This, uh, what is shown here will be the implementation of Schnorr. In Bitcoin, we'll have something like ECDSA, so it's a, bit, it's a bit more complex because it doesn't have this nice linear, linear structure about the different elements. That can be also can be also done, and we have we have actually give the details in the paper. In the paper, we call it adapter signatures, and, and this is a building block that has been used uh, not only for payment chain networks, but for many other applications that require conditional payments. You might have heard of atomic swaps, uh, um, payment channel hubs, but there are several of these uh, constructions that re require this as a, as a building block itself. Okay, but going back a little from, from the technical details, as I mentioned, I'm interested in, in payment channel networks and they're interesting because there are several challenges. So I have given you the idea of what are the security and the privacy challenges, and there are many, many others, the concurrency, routing, and many other, many other aspects that I will be interested to, to discuss and even collaborate with you if you are, if you are interested. So in the last uh, minus five minutes that I have for, for my talk, let me give you a brief overview of what other projects I'm doing related to payment channel networks. So one is what I mentioned, this notion of a script with scripts or adapter signatures. So as, as I have seen, as I have told you, we can encode the logic of a cryptographic problem in the creation of the signature itself. And this is good because um, what we can do is that the ledger then requires a really reduced functionality. The only thing that we require from the ledger is that it's able to verify a data signature as it is done today, pretty much. And we also need time blocks, meaning that, uh, of course, uh, the coins cannot be locked forever. So it could be that we never solve the problem. So we need a time block to have the, the refund of the coins. <coughs> Sorry. The, the interesting challenge question here is that what other off-chain computations based on these scriptless scripts uh, we can have. So what are the other problems apart from the D-log that we can encode in the signature itself? And what are the, the other applications that we can build on top of it? And this is challenging because, I mean, different blockchains support different data signatures. So some support SNOR, some support ECDSA. Monero, for example, supports a linkable working signature. CCAS uses a totally different system. So the question is how we can do like a universal way of, of uh, having scripts and scripts across different blockchain. <coughs> um, as I mentioned so far, our encoding is restricted to the discrete localization problem. But even with this restriction, we managed actually to, to implement payment channel networks. So it's actually a, a powerful, powerful tool. The other part that I'm working on, I'm interested in, is the routing part. Like, as I mentioned, there is uh, a bunch of channels between users. And many times, this topology is not even public. So the question is how we can find the sender and the receiver. <coughs> and many times, the, the payments don't go in a single path, but it could be that goes through several paths itself. So imagine that we want to have a payment between Alice and Bob. What could happen is that, for example, Gabriel and Fabi don't do some forward. Bob is, is malicious or we want to dynamically fragment payments. So Alice could send two units to Carlo and she might not have enough 
in the channel with Edward or Gabriel, but she will have enough easy managed to split it in, into, into fragments. So there are many, many um, challenges that are similar to data networks uh, that we could actually ex uh, also extrapolate to payment channel networks with the difference that here we are talking about money. So we cannot, uh, we don't have the luxury of letting packages to be lost because this would mean that people will lose money in the, in the process. <coughs> I'm really sorry for the for the caffeine. Um, the last aspect that I would like, or the last project that I would like to talk about that I'm okay working on is the creation of what we call a domain specific language to derive which are the security and privacy properties on parent child networks. There have been a work called BitML that create a language of what are the different functionalities that we can do over Bitcoin itself. So they define formally what are the different uh, aspects or actions that we can do in Bitcoin itself. And there have been other works that do the same for Ethereum itself. So they have a domain specific language for what can be done in the Ethereum, co Ethereum contracts. And this is really good because now <clears throat> if we want to reason about security and privacy, we only have to focus in this language and not on the details of the, of the system itself. What I would be interested in working on now is like how I could come up with a language that defines what we can do in the off-chain setting, what we can do in the payment sign network setting itself. And with that, uh, I will, that's all the content I prepared. Thank you a lot again for the attention and for inviting me to give in this talk. And if you have any question, I will be more than happy to answer. Thank you, thank you a lot.